Today I'm going to be moderating this panel with uh, our wondrous, wonderful uh, speakers on um, veridical perceptions in near-death experiences. So first, let me introduce uh, Dr. Janice Minor Holden, who uh, proposed this panel. She, uh, as you probably all know, is uh, a past president of IANS. She is currently the chair of the Department of Counseling and Higher Education at the University of North Texas, and she has 30 years experience as an NDE researcher. She's also the co-author of a wonderful book called The Handbook of Near-Death Experiences that I encourage all of you to take a look at. And she invited to come with her to the panel today uh, two lovely um, NDE experiencers, uh, Stephanie Arnold and Tricia Barker, who will be sharing the stories of their near-death experiences with special emphasis on uh, some of the veridical perceptions that they had. So uh, I will be acting as timekeeper and later on moderator for your question period. So without any further delay, uh, Dr. Jan Holden. Thank you, Yvonne. And uh, if you uh, haven't ever read Yvonne's book, Farther Shores, and you're interested in after effects of spiritually transformative experiences, including NDEs, I highly recommend her book, highly. It's really, it's really excellent. And um, so I'm just going to say a few comments about veridical perception uh, to create some context and then uh, pass the mic to the real stars of the panel, uh, Tricia and Stephanie. Um, I became really what the first thing that interested me in uh, related to NDE research was veridical perception. And I organized the first uh, prospective hospital study designed to try to capture someone in the hospital setting ha being resuscitated and reporting something that could then be verified by the people who were there, you know, right on the spot. And uh, mine was the first of a handful of studies that have been conducted since. And um, the bad news is that none of these studies have yielded a case where we've actually captured veridical perception in the hospital setting, which leaves us in the field. Uh, of course, veridical perception is important because um, the question of whether near-death experiences are you know, live or memorex, whether they're real or hallucinatory, is a fundamental question. Um, until we resolve that question, we can't move on to what I consider to be the even more important question of what do NDEs mean for humanity and the future of humanity. Um, I believe that NDEs contain very powerful messages about um, everything from how we treat each other from moment to moment to um, public policy, but we can't really focus on that until we um, feel confident that the source of NDEs is legitimate. And so uh, what we're left with in the field of near-death studies is uh, cases in which veridical perception has been confirmed by um, credible third parties. And um, as Yvonne said, veridical perception involves uh, perception during a near-death experience where the contents of what the person perceived would be would have been impossible for them to have perceived based on the condition and position of their physical body. So if they're in cardiac arrest and their eyes are taped shut and um, they're and they're fully uh, anesthetized and they can then come back and report very accurately things that happened in the vicinity of their physical body or sometimes away from their physical body and their report can be confirmed um, it's very evidential and so IANS undertook its first publication um, project just recently in this book the self does not die it's a collection of over a hundred cases of verified paranormal phenomena associated with near-death experiences so if you are interested in reading one case after another where a case like this is um, is presented it's uh, it, it was mind-blowing for me and I'm already familiar with this phenomenon I've talked with people who've had these experiences and this book is is very very uh, impactful so um, I highly recommend it if you're not if you haven't been aware of it yet 
And so um, when I do my uh, NDE 101 um, lecture, I use clips from an interview that I did some years back with Trisha. And part of what I use is her uh, veridical perception. So um, um, I'm going to turn the mic over to her to introduce herself and tell you about her NDE and After Effects and um, and uh, any messages that she wants that she believes uh, NDEs have for humanity. Thank you so much, Jan. I'm Trisha Barker. I live in Fort Worth, Texas, and I teach English, and that's part of my mission from the afterlife, but I'll just jump right into the near-death experience. I was a wild, wild, wild college student at the University of Texas, and I was about to run the Austin 10K, and this was a symbol of getting my life back together. I was agnostic at the time. A few weeks before my accident, I started having these premonition dreams that I was going to die, and I was deathly afraid because I thought death was the end. You know, that would be the absolute end of me, and I, I was scared, you know, terrified. Well, I had this head-on collision on the way to run the Austin 10K, and my back was fractured so badly that I was hanging to the side. I couldn't reach my uh, insurance in the glove box, and I knew that I was in very, very bad, bad shape. I didn't have health insurance at the time. I was a college student who grew up very, very poor, and I didn't even imagine getting health insurance until I graduated and got my first job. So I waited in the ER for 17 hours, and I had internal complications. I was just strapped to a board without pills without anything, not even a Tylenol water, um, just screaming. And I overheard a nurse tell someone that I was going, that he was not going to operate on me, this particular surgeon. So I was freaking out. Eventually a surgeon did operate on me and I was wheeled in for surgery and I died very quickly. As soon as they opened up my back, I stepped out of form. And when I hear researchers and scientists talk about they need to verify it, I don't need to verify it. I know that that reality is more real than this reality. The minute I stepped out of form, I was like, here I am. This is the reality that I've been waiting for my entire life. Um, and I knew that I was my spirit form, not this body. And I looked down at the bloody body and I was done with it. <laughs> you know, that was the end. But there were two very large angels waiting there. And they were maybe eight, nine feet tall, um, probably archangels, but they were incredibly intelligent. And they sent this healing light into me, my spirit form. And then they said, watch this. And they sent this healing light into my back, through the backs of the surgeons. And they lit up my body with this light. And I could almost see that the bone fragments that were pressing on my spine were going to be fine and that they would be picked out by the doctors and I would indeed walk. Well, at that point, the monitor flatlined, and I didn't want to look at my body anymore. I knew I was technically dead, and I left the hospital room. And here's my verifiable detail. My mom had just married someone, and this was, you know, my stepdad, but I was in college, and I didn't care to know him. He seemed nice enough, but I saw him stop and get a candy bar, a Snickers bar, out of the vending machine, and I thought, oh, well, I'll never get to know him because I'm dead, and, you know, I hope he treats her well, and, you know, I just had this moment of, of looking at him, and then I continued on, and I had a life review, and since I was young, I, I had not harmed a lot of people. Most of my self-harm had been to myself through drug use and drinking and, you know, pain throughout my life, and... I saw that that harm that I had done to myself could be washed away, it could be instantly forgiven, that I could be new, and that it's so important to be kind to other people. And so I saw my interactions with others, and I saw where I was kind and loving, and these were the interactions that mattered. And then the interactions, I wasn't a bully or mean or anything like that, but I was sometimes too shy and closed off, and I saw that I kind of hurt people by not getting to know them. or or not being open and loving in that way. And I saw all of their thoughts. I felt this kind of oneness with people I had known. And then with many people in Austin, I kind of blended with the town of Austin and felt this oneness with many people. And then soon I was in 
a beautiful landscape, a heavenly landscape. And the only person in my family who had died was my grandfather at that time. And he was there waiting for me. And I heard many messages from a light. It was very far away at this time, but I heard things like remind them to go to nature and love is all that matters. It's all that you take with you. And these seem like very simple statements, even to me at that time, I thought, okay, you know, that's, that's profoundly simple, but um, I, I listened to it, took it in, and believed it to be the truth, and then my grandfather asked if I wanted to continue on, and looking at my life, and I'd suffered much child abuse and poverty and really a lot of things in my life, I didn't feel this connection and heartbreak. I, I didn't feel this connection that I wanted to stay, and so I said, yes, I want to continue on to that light and oh my god and i break down and cry every time i talk about this but that light was so beautiful it was so amazing it was i had never felt that kind of love ever in my life and i felt as if every wound every fear everything about me that felt inadequate was fine the way it was and that i was loved supported and everything was perfect I didn't want to return, but as I neared this light, the light stopped me at some point, and so I didn't get to fully merge with this light, and then God showed me this river. He said, look down, um, he, she, you know, it, when people ask about the voice of angels or God, I'm always confused about how to talk about this. It's more telepathy, or it's more just this internal way of talking. So, you know, there is a message, but it didn't sound like a particular voice. Well, I just heard, look down, and I saw this beautiful river, and this river was flowing, and there were many lights beside the river, and some of the lights were not turned on, and some were, and God said, you have to go back down and teach. And, I, and people have asked me, well, does, did he mean spiritual teacher? And I did not interpret it that way. I saw actual students, and so I thought, saw that I was to teach at many different levels, and teach in junior high, high school, college. I was not excited about this because growing up poor, <laughs> um, this was not a career path that I wanted. Um, I had considered law, considered editing, I'd considered many different things. I was going to graduate and then figure it out um, at that time, travel around some. Well, that was all that I was shown. And then God said, you must return to your body. And I was a little bit angry <laughs> about this. I did not want to come back and be a teacher. Coming back into my body hurt, as many experiencers talk about. I felt like this dark wind pulled me back into my body. And then there I was. Um, and soon I woke up. and. I was aware as soon as I came out of surgery that I had died. And I asked my surgeon, I had a few moments where they gave me ice chips and I was recovering and I asked my surgeon, I died, right? Um, you know, how long was I dead? And she looked at me and I could tell that she was nervous about this. She did not want to talk about the fact that I had died. And she said, we thought we lost you for a couple of minutes. You're fine now. You're getting some blood transfusions. Just wait. You'll feel a lot better. And I could tell that she was trying to brush it off as I was lightheaded. But she did confirm that I was dead. And that was not what she wanted to focus on at all. And it was a long time, um, so several, maybe a month and a half, before I was able to fully confirm my verified incident with my mother. But there's a lot to this story. But my mom is an evangelical Christian, and her minister gave me pamphlets about how my near-death experience was of the devil because I didn't see Jesus. And, you know, that loving light could be any number of, um, you know, great teachers. It was, it, you know, God was God to me at that moment. And so it was difficult for me to open up to my mom. But at one point I did ask her, I said, I felt your prayers on the other side. That was something I felt. And I said, I know that you prayed for me. I know that your mom, my grandmother prayed for me. Um, and I did die, and I know what time I died. I died at the time that James, my stepdad, got this candy bar, and she said, oh, that's really funny, because when your dad showed up, my real dad showed up to the ER, my stepdad came in right at the time that they both fell to their knees and started praying, because they were certain that I had died, um, my mom and my dad. 
and they were just overwhelmed with this grief and my stepdad walked in and he's funny and he made a joke and he had his Snickers bar and then they got up and everything was okay and so to me that was incredible confirmation that at the very time I was feeling their prayers and I was truly dead they were actually praying for me and then I did see my stepfather you know those moments before um, he got back to them I think near-death experiences are so profound for those of us who have had them because I went from being this fearful, dark, angry, scared young woman to someone who was full of great hope and light and happiness and, you know, I was driven to read materials from spiritual teachers and I had never considered any of these materials before and suddenly, you know, I was just filled with energy for this. Luckily. Um, Raymond Moody had written a book at this time, 1994 was when I had my near-death experience, and Dan and Brinkley, so I was able to feel some confirmation and some peace about my experience. I've heard from many experiencers who had experiences in the 60s and they felt as if, you know, there was no one around at that time to confirm what they had gone through, but I had that confirmation. It gave me much more confidence, but I didn't feel this drive to join IANS or tell my story. I told my story to thousands of students. So, you know, maybe these school districts didn't appreciate it, but I told these stories and, uh, you know, I was a rebel, a renegade in these classrooms and taught meditation long before this was in vogue in classrooms. And I always open students up to this possibility of being more than they thought they would, could, could be with the help of the other side. And I, I certainly felt guidance in the classroom. Uh, I, it was not the career that I wanted, but it was certainly one that I felt completely at ease doing, mainly because I knew that I always had the opportunity to help someone. As a teacher, just a kind word can be the one thing that helps that person succeed, or just you know, belief in someone can change their life in, in great ways. But that is my story in a nutshell. I have written a book about my story, but it is not out. And I, I waited 20 years to write this book because I was only told with my mission to come back and teach. But two years ago, I was walking down the stairs at my college and I heard this booming voice that said, your mission is done, it's complete, you can do whatever you want now. And I thought, well, can I go to a beach and just hang out? <laughs> you know, do, do I have to do anything? <laughs> you know, like, um, but I think the key to that was do whatever you want. I wondered if I was going to die, you know, and my mission was complete in that sense. But I've since realized that if I apply the same principles of the near-death experience, and if anyone in their lives applies the same principles of a near-death experience to be kind to others, to remind them of their power and their connection to source and how this can heal them in great ways, then they're doing what they need to be doing in this world. And so I, I realized I'm an English major. I love to write. Why not write about my life? And I wanted to connect it, the near-death experience, to my life in a real way. So this is a memoir much like The Liars Club or any, any memoir out there like Wild. It's a traditional memoir, but it has a near-death experience in it. So it, I'm hoping that it's not classified just as a spiritual memoir. I'm hoping it makes that crossover into mainstream readers' hands who may be even agnostic like I was back then. That's, that's my hope. And maybe it'll reach college students as well. But I'm looking for an agent if anyone knows one. <laughs> but thank you very much. Hi, I'm Stephanie Arnold. Um, my near-death experience happened four years ago. I was pregnant with our second child, and at the time, I had had a baby before, and I, I had a C-section before. There were no problems, no complications. I gave birth at 41 weeks. I was back at work eight days later. Uh, this was a little different. At 20 weeks at the ultrasound, I was diagnosed with a placenta previa, which is not abnormal, it's a one in 200 risk. Well, it's kind of abnormal, but one in 200 risk, basically the placenta is growing on top of the cervix. And the doctors just say, just take it easy. But at that moment, I told my husband and I told the doctors, I've got a very bad feeling about this. Well, that bad feeling turned into very detailed premonitions. I had, I had a vision that my placenta previa was going to combine my cervix, or my uterus was gonna combine with the placenta. 
I was going to hemorrhage. I was going to need a hysterectomy. I was going to be put under general anesthesia. Um, the baby was going to be fine, and I was ultimately going to die. I am married to a PhD economist from University of Chicago. Telling my husband, I go, boo? Did you say it's boo? <laughs> um, I, you know, he was a former Air Force pilot, very linear, very analytical in his thinking, and he's telling me, sweetheart, you're fine. And every time I would have these visions, I said, I'm telling you this is going to happen. And I'd go to doctor after doctor. I'd tell every single one of them. I'd tell the nurses. I'd have ultrasounds. Everybody was like, Mrs. Arnold, are you stressed? Maybe you need to rest. Maybe you need to sleep. And I said, no, I don't need sleep. I'm telling you this is going to happen. And so at one point, I sought out specialists. We were at, in Chicago giving birth at Northwestern. And I made an appointment with the head of gynecological oncology. Now, the reason I did this is that if you have a problem when you give birth and your OB can't handle an emergency operation and there's, your life is at risk, they pass it on to maternal fetal medicine. Well, maternal fetal medicine doesn't have as much experience with high-risk patients having this kind in the reproductive organ side. So they told me that the person that's the high, that handles the highest risk surgeries, especially when 20% of your blood supply is going straight to the uterus, would be a gynonc. So try and make an appointment with the head of gynonc at Northwestern Memorial Hospital when you don't have reproductive organ cancer and you're a healthy seven-month pregnant woman. It wasn't easy. And when I finally got the appointment, I'm sitting in the waiting room. My husband is like, honey, I'm embarrassed to be here. And I said, sweetheart, I don't know what to tell you because everybody is telling me there's nothing happening, but I still see it happening down the road. It's like I am the only one seeing this freight train about to hit me and everybody else sees a field of flowers. And so we get into the Guy Knox consultation room and there's a resident there and she's taking notes. And he's like, how can I help you, Mrs. Arnold? I said, well, I have a placenta previa. It's going to turn into an accreta. I'm going to hemorrhage. I'm O negative, which is a very, very rare blood type. So you need to prepare the operating room, and you're going to give me my hysterectomy. And he's like, and the resident stops, and they look at me, and he says, have you been on the internet? Yes, I have, but this is going to happen. So cut to everybody telling me, no, 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 and my husband saying, uh, so the gynec says, okay, well, maybe you should get an MRI. If the MRI is positive for what you think of this merger between the uterus and the placenta, then, um, then I'll schedule myself for a, your mandatory C-section, and we'll do the hysterectomy there, no problem. And I felt better, because all of a sudden I felt like I was being heard. So I go have the MRI. The MRI is negative for, for what I thought. So my husband says, you should feel better. I said, no, actually, I feel worse because I'm running out of people telling my crazy foreboding story to. So my gynecologist says, you know, why don't you have a consultation with anesthesia? I said, why? I didn't have one before with my first child. And he's, she says, well, it might help you think about what's, what the process is going to be after you give birth. And I said, OK, fine. So I pick up the phone. I have the phone consult with a, a young fellow by the name of Dr. Grace Lim. And she's telling me what's going to happen, epidural, where you're going to recover, and all this. I said, that's great, except what happens if this, 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 and this happens? And she says, she stopped talking for a moment, and she hesitated, and she said, you know, Mrs. Arnold, you're in a teaching hospital. You're in very good hands. You know, just please try to relax, and I hope I made you feel better. But I wasn't feeling better. So I took to Facebook. I said, if anybody has my blood type, I'm going to need it. I wrote goodbye letters. I sent out goodbye letters. I told people in those letters what exactly what was going to happen to me and how much I loved them and I cared for them. Come D-Day, 36 weeks pregnant, my husband's in New York, and I start bleeding all over the kitchen floor. So we get to the hospital. My friend's there with our baby. And, um, and she's one and a half at the time. And, you know, I'm telling my doctor, I'm like, I really have a bad feeling about this. And she's like, Stephanie, I think you're just nervous because your husband's not here. I said, I said, Julie, and she's now my friend. She's given birth, she's, uh, you know, delivered my first child. So, Julie, there's something wrong. You need to put me under general anesthesia. 
She says, Stephanie, I'm not going to do that because it's going to put the baby to sleep. You're fine. I promise you, you're fine. So she looks at my daughter and is like, Mommy's going to be back soon. I hug my daughter a million times, kiss her, and as they're wheeling me out to the operating room, I break down crying because I know it's the last time I'm going to see her. I get to the operating room, and at that point, I just, this is the operating room that's going to give life to my son and take mine. I was convinced. So you're, I have an epidural in, I'm not going anywhere. An anesthesiologist once told me, like, if you were my patient, I wouldn't do the procedure. Hearing all the foreboding, I said, yeah, but this baby was coming out no matter what. So there's no way you're going to stop this from happening. So I'm in the operating room, and all of a sudden, the nurses, the doctors, these voices are going faint. And they're asking Mrs. Arnold, do you need a blanket? Mrs. Arnold, do you need anything? Do you? And I just disconnected at that moment. I gave birth to a very healthy baby boy. And three seconds later, I was dead. So what happened? I had an amniotic fluid embolism, a very rare one in 40,000 risk where amniotic cells get into the mother's bloodstream. And if you happen to be allergic to it, your body goes into somewhat of an anaphylactic shock. And in most cases, women don't make it. I went into cardiac arrest. They intubated me, taped my eyes shut. I was having a C-section, so there was a curtain in front of my face. And that's when the fun began. My lungs shut down, and the body goes into full DIC. Your normal body has 20 units of blood. I was given 60 units of blood and blood product to save my life. The only reason I'm alive is that anesthesiologist didn't feel comfortable with how she left that phone call. And she said something told her to flag my file and incorporate extra blood and a crash cart in the operating room at the time of delivery. I go into full DIC, I get transferred to the surgical ICU, and that's when my husband arrives. He says to the nurses and the doctors, if she needs a hysterectomy, this is the doctor we met with two months before. It's like, Mr. Arnold, Dr. Arnold, I don't think we're, we're going to need that. Um, she's stable right now, but it's touch and go, so we don't know what's going to happen. Everything's calm in the ICU. Seven hours later, they determine that I'm still hemorrhaging, and they call in the doctor. I met with two months before to perform the hysterectomy. When they did the pathology on the uterus, they showed that that merger between the placenta and the accreta, or the placenta and the uterus, had started to form. It was just microscopic, and they couldn't see it from the MRI. Medically induced coma for six days. I went into kidney failure. I started dialysis. And when they pulled me down off of the meds, I looked at my swollen belly severe edema, and I said, am I still freaking pregnant? <laughs> and my husband said at that point he knew I was going to be okay. I knew where I was, and I was cursing. So after a month in a hospital and physical therapy and dialysis and everything else, I come out of this, and every single doctor, and mind you, I'm in a teaching hospital, so I touched cardiology, nephrology, hematology, every nurse there, everybody was praying for me. I was one of the highest acuity cases at the time. And it was, it was one person after another after another saying, do you know what a miracle it is you survived? God has a plan for you. Well, that wasn't making me feel very comfortable. And it wasn't helping with my recovery. So I sought therapist after therapist after therapist. And every time we'd start therapy, they'd say, so how can we help you? And I said, well, you know, I need to understand how it is I saw everything in great detail months before it happened. And they said, let's not worry about that right now. Let's just worry about getting you out of the trauma. I said, see, that does not help me because what happens if I have another premonition? I told my story to a local CBS affiliate in Chicago. And the very next day, I was not prepared for what would happen the next day. The next day was the cover story of Yahoo globally. Then we were on Good Morning America. Then we were on Steve Harvey and the doctors and everything. And Steve said to me, he's like, did you see the light? I said, I don't know, man. They gave me a lot of drugs. I don't remember. And I thought it was, at that point, um, I, I wasn't after understanding about the near-death experience because I was trying to get over the trauma, but I also was dealing with the premonitions. I had no idea that the premonitions at the time were connected to the NDE. 
which was very interesting for me because this process has taken me on this kind of roller coaster ride, and I was, I was determined to find out how the premonitions happened. And I write in my book, I, the book was published by HarperCollins, and um, it's called 37 Seconds, and in the book I talk that I've had intuitive thoughts as a kid, but half of the time I was wrong. So the times that you were right, someone died. And when somebody died as a kid, as a 10 and 12 year old kid, and you can see those things, you compartmentalize it and you do not talk about it anymore until it was your own foreboding. So I'm going to show you a clip. So any, what happened was, is through this process, I ended up finding a regression therapist. And if you, those of you don't know, a regression therapist uses hypnotherapy to take you back into those moments of trauma to give you kind of a view as an observer into your traumas and, and maybe to take you outside of it so that you can see, not that it wasn't bad because it was bad, but that it can give you some sort of explanation that you can see something else going on. I wasn't expecting what would happen. I videotaped my therapy for, for two main reasons. One, I'm st still to this day under uh, neurological care because the mind plays games on you when you're on barbiturates and been in a coma. But I didn't know if I would remember anything. And the second thing was, is I'm a little type A if you can't figure that out. So I didn't want anyone tampering with my mind. And if they said chicken, I'd be walking like a chicken, you know, so I'd never been hypnotized before. So what you're going to see is this split screen is one of my therapy sessions. Um, I did 30 hours of therapy. I cut it down to three and a half minutes that you're going to see three different clips. Um, the first one is going to be at that moment that she finally got me to the operating room. And then you're going to see in the second clip a moment where I started seeing spirits. And then I will come back after that video and just explain to you what was verified through it all. And I explained to Stephanie, it's going to happen very quickly and I'm gonna embrace you and I'm gonna hold on to you and I'm not gonna let go. known you to be a fighter. I've always known you to survive. Uh. You know what he said, you know what to do. Mm. But I need help. And he says, you don't need help. You know exactly what to do. You've always known what to do. You knew what to do when you were telling the doctors you know what to do now. No, when I was standing with my uncle, that is, that you always knew what to do, and I turned around and I saw everything uh, being done. Uh, and 
So is that realization that made you feel this way? It's yeah. seeing all the stuff that the body went through. Yeah. But your body is so strong that whatever it was, it healed. I need a, I need a drink. Huh? Need a drink? <laughs> I drank heavily that night. Um, so, so here, so here's the thing. The, what was verified? I had, I had 30 hours of this. So in this particular one before the spirit side, I explained what was happening in the operating room after I flatlined. I explained that my anesthesiologist was by my feet. I explained who hit the button for the code. I explained who was the nurse that jumped on my chest and gave me CPR. I explained where the nurse's break room was on the surgical floor. I explained what my nanny was doing with my daughter at the time in the labor and delivery room. I explained what my husband was wearing when he got off the plane um, coming into the hospital. So my husband, and there were a few other things, and so my husband takes a quick look at the first part of the therapy, and obviously as my husband, he's like, he slams the computer down, he's like, I don't understand why you're doing this. We're fine, typical Air Force mentality, suppress, repress, let's move on, right? He's like, and besides, how do you know any of this is true? This could be a recalled episode of Grey's Anatomy in your head. So I said, you're absolutely right. So I called my therapist and I said, um, how do I know this is true? And she said, well, sometimes the only truth we get is that the patient feels better. That's the only validation we need. And I said, yeah, that doesn't work for me. I said, because there were a lot of witnesses of what I'm saying. So lucky for me, I had it on tape. It wasn't even hearsay of like, oh, let me recall the story and everything. So I brought the tapes back to the doctors and I videotaped the doctors while they were watching the therapy. And my one doctor says, I didn't go to medical school for this. I don't know how you know any of this. This wouldn't be in medical files. This isn't something. That, I said, did the first crash cart attempt not work and the second one did? She's like, how do you know that? I said, and then this nurse walked into the room and she's like, Stephanie, you don't, you, Mrs. Arnold, you probably don't remember. I'm like, you're the one that broke my ribs. And she was startled by that. And as we were walking back, I said, is the break room right there? And they're like, yeah, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that. And then I said to my gynecologist, I said, did you keep saying this can't be happening, this can't be happening? After all the months of me telling her that this was going to happen, I, did you keep saying that? She said, I did, but in my head. And then the kicker was for my husband. I said, our doctor didn't deliver the baby. He said, how do you know? I said, I saw it in my regression therapy. He said, oh, okay. He says, of course she delivered the baby. There was blood all over her scrub. She was there. I said, I'm not saying she wasn't there. He's like, oh, well, then who delivered it? I said, the gynonc resident that was taking the notes delivered our baby. He said, why would the gynonc resident take, that was taking the notes be the one delivering the baby if she was on gynonc rotation? I said, I don't know. This is what I saw. He's like, okay, you're crazy. And so he's like, I want to listen to what your doctor's saying in person. I said, no problem. So I asked my doctor. I said, I just need to know if you delivered the baby. And Jonathan said, you did, right? You delivered the baby. And the doctor's like, no, actually I didn't. And I said, was it the gynonc resident? And she looked at me perplexed. She said, how do you know that? At that moment, I had the answers I needed. I no longer question whether this is science or spirit that helped save my life. Thank you. What extraordinary uh, stories. Thank you for sharing. Um, just a, a couple comments before we open the floor to questions. So certainly we've seen here really clear evidence that uh, observations made while out of body in near-death experiences have been confirmed that they were accurate. Uh, which supports what we've been talking about at this conference all day, that consciousness is not limited to the physical body, but is beyond the physical body. Um, and just to add here in my own work, uh, this is true of uh, observations in other types of spiritually transformative experiences too, such as past life recall and remote viewing. Um, so it's not just limited to near-death experiences where uh, 
observances are verified. So uh, we would now open the floor to questions. If you have any questions, we have a, a living uh, microphone holder today who will uh, field the questions for you. So please come forward. Stephanie, but your premonition said, didn't, I, I gathered your premonition, didn't think you were gonna come back because you thought you're never gonna see your daughter again. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So the, the premonition did come true that I died, right? So I, I, all six premonitions I had came true. Uh, my husband likes to say, well, your premonition didn't come true, you didn't stay dead. So I give it to him. Um, I, I fought. And so what I think where some people say that it was comfortable for them and seeing the afterlife and everything that they experienced, I think that that's one thing, but I wasn't ready to go. So I feel like the premonitions and everything that was given to me, I had two choices. I could shut up after the fourth and fifth and sixth doctor told me to relax. And some, and people say that to me, you know, they're like after the fourth and fifth doctor said, you're crazy. Um, I would have stayed quiet and I said, then you would have stayed dead. So at some point this information was coming and as an advocate, as a patient advocate, as a, a human being advocate, I would say, you have, you know, God helps those who help themselves, right? So you're given this information, what strength do you have to pursue the information that's been given? Through all of this experience, was your husband ever able to come around, or is he still the military in a box kind of guy? So here's the thing. It's a, it's a great question, and I write this in the book. It's actually the interesting about it is it it he has absolutely changed. I spoke at the University of Chicago's medical school, and I also spoke at University of Chicago's um, divinity school in the same year, which was really great for him to watch both. And for him, especially with his analytical mind, he's like, I can no longer deny what I witnessed. I can no longer deny what I've experienced. And when his professors and lawyers and people that, that you know, kind of question what happened, he said, you know what? I've run out of people to ask the question to. So he accepts it. Well, Trisha, uh, your stepdad's getting the candy bar, was that unusual? Yes, they're health nuts. So they pretend to be like these vegans who eat no sugar and like they're the most healthy. They grow their own organic garden. And so I found out later that he secretly keeps a stash of Oreos and things <laughs> hidden from my mom. But I didn't know about that. You know, I really didn't hang out with them. But I went back to their house to recover after my accident. And I, I learned and a lot more and got to know them. And there was a lot of healing that came from spending time with them together. He's a, yeah. a really good guy. So, d but uh, did you ask him about the candy bar yeah, in the hospital? Yeah, not in the hospital um, because like I kept no, talking. No, but I mean that he was in, you know, when, when you oh, had yes. your NDE. Yes. Did you get a candy bar then? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we, we did uh, talk about that. And, yeah. and so he admitted to hiding stuff from my mom. <laughs> <laughs> you found him out. Okay, that's yes. interesting. And, and Stephanie, you're, um, you saw what your daughter was doing with the, the nanny. And can you describe that? And, and how did, did you verify that? I did. So one of the things I kept saying is that she was playing Doc McStuffins, which she doesn't watch, but it was a cartoon about a, a, a little girl who's a doctor on her toys, right? And so she was grabbing the stethoscope on top of a piece of furniture, which I wouldn't let my daughter climb up. So she was climbing up onto the table trying to get the stethoscope while the name was trying to pull at her. And she was dancing around that table singing a specific song. So, you know, I just remember, was she doing this? Was she on the table? And they were like, how do you, again, how do you know how that? You know and I'm that? like, yeah. oh, it was a good guess. <laughs> a good guess. It's a good guess. Everything was just a good guess. Okay, thank you. Um, is it on? It doesn't sound like it when you're talking. 
Uh, Jan, when you were doing the study on uh, near-death experiences in the hospital setting and you didn't actually get any information when you were actually doing the study, I had a, I'm a three-time near-death experiencer and I was a nurse for 30 years and I had a near-death experience in Texas in 1970 at Baptist Hospital in San Antonio and my um, experiential thing really was as simple as just seeing the doctor's pin the cross pin come out of his pocket when he leaned over to do CPR. And at that time, you know, we didn't use that little piece of uh, plastic between the caregiver's mouth and the patient's mouth. And so when he put his uh, mouth down over mine, it was in the follow-up appointment afterwards with my mom that I said, you know, mom, you remember when you told me that, you know, sometimes people shouldn't get inappropriate with kids, you know, it's like where they can't touch and this and that. I said, you know, that doctor, he gave me a movie star kiss during this whole situation. And I said, you know, I, so I think he was inappropriate. And I thought maybe she needed to get on to him. And he was just like, oh my, well, wait a minute. What are you talking about? His name was Dr. Tilgen. I don't know if you're familiar with anybody in San Antonio area. But um, he was an ear specialist and I was having surgery to see why I'm deaf in my right ear. And it turns out that I'm deaf in my right ear because I do, as so many of us near-death experiencers are, I, I, I'm a psychic and a medium. And I left nursing in 2011. But I hear spirit in the right ear. And I hear the physical in the left ear. And, uh, but he did, he defended himself and he said, listen, I leaned over to give her breaths for CPR and that wasn't working. So then they brought the crash card and they went ahead and did the, the paddles on the chest. And um, in my first and third near death experience, I really was just in the hospital setting. But as Trisha and uh, Stephanie said, it's when you go to that other side that you really have the experience. And that was my second one when I had uh, um, hepatitis from a blood transfusion. But, I think it's interesting that when we try to study these things in a medical setting, it seems like when we set it all up, it doesn't happen. And yet you know you've heard so many experiential situations where we know it happened. And I don't know why that is. You know, I think that's really interesting. But I love your work. And I'm excited to see all of you in person. I know some of you from Facebook, Tricia. Um, so anyway, thank you so much for what you're doing. And, and keep trying. And hopefully someday that will, you know, end up being something that you can actually quantify. Yeah. But we all know it's true, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and and I know it's true too. But it, there's a you know segment of society out there that uh, I conceptualize people in three categories. There are people who know, there are people who are open to evidence, and there are people who are certain this couldn't possibly be. So my focus is that middle group, and and um, you know helping them move into the other group. Um, but it is a, an interesting question about why this hasn't been captured yet. And um, some of it may have to do with all the studies have involved visual targets that are uh, planted in a way that they're visible from the ceiling. And, um, but when people have veridical perception, it's around things that they have an emotional connection to. You know, Trisha's, um, even though you didn't know your stepfather well, the Snickers bar, and, and he probably was doing that for comfort food and, you know, out of the stress of your situation. And so there's this emotional context and, you know, seeing your daughter and um, all of this. So, um, so it's very challenging to think of a, a research design that, that somehow involves uh, visual targets that would be emotionally meaningful to the person who's out of their body and really doesn't care about a, a, a sign, right, exactly, that I've placed there. Yeah, thank you. And our last question. I just want to say I'm really moved. Um, you all seem like pioneers, involuntary pi by, uh, pioneers, but it's so fabulous to receive the gems. Um, my question is, what keeps you brave? Like, despite having a, a parent or a step-parent saying that, or a preacher saying that, you know, what you've seen is evil, or despite what doctors are not verifying, or how do you keep being inspired to speak out? Because we, I know I receive so much when we speak out. Well, that was part of my mission, I guess, was to talk about it and remind others of their light and their connection to spirit. And so I didn't have a choice. I had to be brave. And I, I felt that 
the minute I opened my mouth, then the right things would come through me to help other people. And in the classroom that worked, you know, I saw certain lights turn on in students or people, basically students in the worst possible situations, I mean, who suffered so much more than I suffered as a kid. And I knew that I could help them in some way, some little way. And so that made me brave to a degree. But also I think the more we talk about it, the more we shift the focus away from people who attack near-death experience. And then they do. You know, I didn't expect that. I've been blogging and, and uh, making YouTube videos for a year and a half now, and I, I was shocked by the attack. <laughs> but it is, you know, it's just part of the journey, and I think their minds might open up a little more over time. But I do it for the people who are interested. Yeah, and I'll echo the sentiment. I, I, you know, for the survive the people who did not survive, the fifty percent that did not survive what I had, um, I am a voice. I survived. What do you do? There's a responsibility with that survival. Um, I'm being the advocate by standing there and saying, "All right, you know what? Come at me." But this, these are the facts. This is the evidence. This is undisputed so I don't care if you're skeptic come at me it's all good the facts are the facts it's no problem so so that doesn't that doesn't phase me at all what's interesting is what's happening out of our story which is you know people are coming up to me saying you know I have intuitive thoughts but people tell me I'm a little crazy or thank you for validating that I thought my husband is going to die and everybody keeps telling me just to think positively and stop thinking negatively. And I'm like, you know what? What's the worst case scenario? You've prepared for your husband to die and you've expressed how much you love him and get your everything in order and he doesn't? Well, great, right? But in case he does, your friends are gonna be the ones saying, how'd you know? That doesn't help you. So by speaking out not only helps the individuals that have that kind of vibration, that have the sixth sense, just because you can't categorize it in one of the five senses doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And from a medical standpoint, at these medical conferences, to have, I, I spoke two weeks ago in front of 3,000 nurses at A1, right? So neonatal nurses conference. They came up one after another saying how many patients each one of them have had that had a premonition or had a feeling and half of the time they were right and half of the time some listened and some didn't and the what kills me with the nurses as compassionate as they are they take on that because they feel like I should have done something different so whether it's my story whether it's Trisha's story whether it's Jan's story whether it's Yvonne's story or any of your stories here it helps that one person listen differently to themselves whether they think it's spirit or whether they think it's coming from someplace else makes no difference. At the end of the day, if you've influenced them because of your experience, you might have just saved a life. I would like to quickly add too that I think we speak because Stephanie probably reaches different people than I reach and we all come from different places. I wanted to leave. She very much wanted to stay and was fighting to stay. So, you know, I, I reach a lot of people who are suicidal or are really hurting in deep ways and that's, um, you know, I think that as individuals we're meant to talk so that we connect with who we're meant to connect with. And I'd just like to make one final comment and then we will end. Um, as I said, I've had four near-death experiences over the course of my lifetime. And as I write in one of my books that's uh, pending publication, after each of my adult near-death experiences, I got into a lot of negative flack. And even though I've written about it and I'm a res known researcher in the field, I still continued to get negative flack. There are, I've just accepted that that's part of the world. People are at different stages of development and there will always be some people that um, feel the need to attack you for whatever reason because they don't believe what you're saying. But what's given me strength, and that's what I wanted to end with, is that it's truth. And that I think truth has a powerful vibration. And I've always anchored myself on that. I am speaking my truth. And that truth is solid. It's like a rock. And people may not believe my truth, but it is my truth. And then the second thing is spirit that you know, spirit is the ultimate judge and spirit will reveal all to all of us in the end. So with that, I'd like to thank all of our panelists and thank you for listening to us this afternoon.